and please let us know a little about yourself. Thank you, Paige, and uh, good morning to everyone, and welcome to this webinar. So my name is Will Stefanov. I am a geologist who also does remote sensing work, and I'll describe what that means a little bit later as we go. Uh, I'm based here at NASA Johnson Space Center, and I've been here for 14 years. And I originally was uh, came from Massachusetts, uh, where I first became interested in looking at rocks by kind of just walking around the area and picking up uh, pebbles from stream beds. Uh, I then moved to Arizona to do my graduate degrees at Arizona State University. And uh, for those of you who are from Arizona, you know very well that the, it's a great place to look at rocks. Uh, none of that pesky vegetation to get in the way. Uh, and then uh, after uh, getting my PhD at Arizona State, uh, both my wife and I moved out here to Johnson Space Center to uh, work on remote sensing from the International Space Station. And that's what I currently do now. Uh, I lead a group of scientists here who are involved with uh, helping develop the International Space Station for remote sensing, dealing directly with the Crew Earth Observations Facility, which collects astronaut photography from the station. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, and working with uh, international partners and scientists from around the world to use that data. So uh, with, with that, we'll start moving into the, uh, the discussion itself. So our title slide here, what you're seeing is a uh, lava flow that occurred on Hawaii, in Hawaii, uh, in 2008. And this particular lava flow, what you're seeing, is actually uh, running through a forest in between two major roadways. And the lava flows in Hawaii occur quite frequently due to the active volcanoes there. And uh, the lava flows frequently will just flow over roadways and through housing subdivisions and uh, cause damage to, to property. Uh, no loss of life, really, because typically these, these lava flows move slowly enough that you can get out of the way. But even though they're slow, you can't really stop them. So if something's in the way, the lava flow will just plow over it. Uh, but I like this shot because it's, it's kind of a really graphic indication of one of the natural hazards that we'll talk about today from volcanoes. Uh, but it also highlights uh, a particular interest of mine, which is volcanoes. So we'll talk a little bit about what, what, when we talk about natural hazards, what does that mean? Well, we're going to define them here as a natural hazard is a naturally occurring event or process uh, that has a potential negative effect on humans and or the environment. And that's important because that falls into the, the designation of hazard. These are natural processes. Volcanoes are natural processes. Hurricanes and typhoons are natural processes. And flooding is also a natural process. It becomes a hazard or potentially a catastrophe when it impacts human beings and, our, and, and uh, human property. Most uh, any event that, that, say, affects a major city or uh, causes large disruptions to services, power, that kind of thing, that's when we begin to think of them as catastrophic, or we define them as disasters. If the volcano erupts where no one's living around it, uh, it's recognized as a natural process, but it's not necessarily considered a, a hazard or a disaster because it's not impacting property, it's not damaging property, it's not resulting in loss of life. So that's an important definition to keep in mind here as, as we move forward. Oops. Hold on, I'm going to give myself control again. There we go. Okay. So this is just a list of some of the major types of, of natural hazards. And so we have our first quiz uh, about two minutes into the, to the talk. What we'd like to know is uh, what do you think are, say, three natural hazard types that are easiest to see from space? Because uh, that's where we're observing them from. So just think about that for a few minutes. You, know, you can look at this list on the left and just think about which ones do you think are the easiest to see from space. And so go ahead and put your answers in the chat window. This is where it's so important for you to make sure you have your chat window settings set to send to everyone so that we can make sure that we can read your answers here. So think about uh, Will's question here and let us know which top three things you think are the easiest to see. So we've got some answers coming in. The Rice School from Texas is saying number two, earthquakes. Mansfield High School says landslides, tsunamis, and volcanoes can be visible from space. Ms. Ackerland's group from Lynn Haven is saying hurricanes, wildfires, and volcanoes. 
the Wright School has added in some coastal and marine types of hazards are visible as well as wildfires. Now, Smith Elementary, very interestingly, has said volcanoes, floods, and asteroid impacts. Uh, so, Will, you might be able to say something about that as well. Jack Barnes in, El in Elementary in Arizona says erosion and landslides. Our group from Illinois, Alan B. Shepard, says volcanoes, hurricanes, and landslides. So we seem to have quite a few uh, volcanoes, hurricanes, wildfires, and even Easton Elementary, one of our groups from Maine, says number one, five, and seven as well, so possibly even flooding. And even Murfreesboro has gotten in there that floods and coastal marine types of things as well as Number three, volcanoes. So what do you think on this, Will? Some really good answers of what they think they can already see. Yep, and all really good answers. And, and the answer to your, to your uh, and yes, you can see virtually all of these types of hazards uh, depending on one, how big the effect is and how big the feature is uh, and what kind of data you're looking at. Now. For the purposes of our webinar today, I focused on three of the most the most normally visible or the most frequently visible types of hazards, and those would be volcanoes, uh, large storms, uh, and floods. Now, these other hazards that you see, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, you can see the effects of tsunamis. Earthquakes are actually kind of difficult to see from space unless you're looking at very, very detailed imagery of the ground surface. And by very detailed, I mean very high resolution in that you can distinguish very small features on the ground in the imagery. Uh, with the sensors that we currently have on the International Space Station, it's difficult to see the effects of earthquakes because we, we don't collect that, that detail of, of information. But for some satellite sensors that do collect that very high resolution, you can see some of the damage that results from earthquakes. More typically, if the earthquake spawns a big tsunami that leads to flooding, that's something that you can more typically see with data from the International Space Station. Uh, the, the one uh, comment of asteroid impacts is a very interesting one because uh, we, we haven't seen any recent asteroid impacts on the surface of the Earth, but we do have quite a few uh, meteor craters that we can view. And most of those you can see from space, you can see from the International Space Station. There are some, however, some large asteroid impacts or large uh, meteor impacts that we know are present, but you can't see from space, at least not in the imagery from the National Space Station. One good example of that is the uh, Chicxulub impact structure kind of in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that that was, is largely thought to be the record of the impact that, that killed off the dinosaurs um, 65 million years ago. That's not visible from the surface anymore, one, because it's underwater, and two, because geological processes have kind of reshaped the land surface. But in the subsurface, you can see geological evidence of that. So the point to take away from here is that a lot of these hazards, yes, you can see from space. Some are, some are harder to see than others. And some, uh, you, don't, you, you can see over a long period of time, like sea level rise. That's what we would call a slow hazard in that it takes place not over a period of, of days or even months, it takes place over years, sometimes 10, 20, uh, 50, 100, 200 years. Uh, we can measure sea level rise here in the Houston area over the past 100 years, but it's hard to see in remotely sensed data uh, unless you have a very long series of images to look at. Other, other hazards that we would consider very short-term hazards, like a volcanic eruption or a hurricane, that it's very easy to see the effects over a very short period of time. Like you could see in perhaps one image from the space station as opposed to several. So let's move on to our next slide. Now I've mentioned a couple times the term remote sensing. Now all remote sensing means is it's the science of obtaining information from a land surface or an object or the atmosphere without actually touching or physically interacting with that object or land surface. Um, you can collect rock samples, soil samples, bring them into a laboratory and do a lot of sophisticated analyses on them using instruments in the lab to get at things like the chemical composition, what minerals are there. But that's an example of physical interaction. 
you're taking that specimen, you're typically crushing it, uh, processing it, putting it into an instrument, so you're physically changing the, the, the material itself. Remote sensing attempts to get that same information without uh, physically interacting with the surface. And that's how we're able to do things like collect information from space. That's also how we know what we know about other planetary bodies in the, in the solar system like Mars or now cometary surfaces. We're doing it by remote sensing because we're not actually uh, interacting with that surface. Now what you see on your screen now is a little uh, graphic that kind of shows some of how remote sensing works. You've got the sun up here in the upper left corner and that transmits energy onto the Earth's surface. That energy interacts with the surface and then reflects or is absorbed by that surface and then sends information back up, radiates or reflects light energy uh, or heat energy back up to the orbiting sensor. In this case, uh, this isn't the International Space Station, but it's a stand-in. That energy also interacts with the atmosphere because it has to pass through the atmosphere to get up to the orbiting sensor. And so you have to take that into account. And then you have other forms of energy like thermal energy that can also be detected by aircraft or spacecraft. You can also have that same energy emitted by clouds. So it's a very complex science to understand. You need to take all these things into effect, but at the, at the end, at the, uh, the end of this pathway, you collect data from orbit and scientists can look at that data and understand uh, both what that surface material is that you were looking at initially you can also understand what the processes are that take place getting from the ground to the sensor. And you can also get at, depending on the sensor, things like topography, how the land surface is configured, depending on the sensor you have. Uh, some of the things to keep in mind is that uh, for what we call a passive system, this is, a, this is sun energy interacting with the surface, you're only looking at the very uppermost surface. Uh, with remote sensing from orbit, you don't get subsurface information. You can't do uh, subsurface geologic mapping in most cases from orbit, but you are looking at the uppermost surface. So you can see how things change over spatial scale as you go from say point A to point B on the land surface. Now let's talk a little bit about the International Space Station itself. And we have our next question. Um, International Space Station, of course, is in orbit. Uh, think about a little bit, how big do you think the ISS uh, is in terms of some of these four choices. You know, just think about that. Get a sense of scale of the, of the International Space Station. And we do already have answers coming in. So whether you think it's the size of an SUV, a football field, the school lunchroom, or some place you hopefully don't visit too often, the principal's office, unless you're, you're chatting nicely with the principal. But let's see what we've got from Mansfield High School. And Rice School, right away, they say the size of a football field. Jack Barnes from Arizona, Lynn Haven, Miss Stafford, as well as Smith Elementary say a football field. Allen B. Shepard and Murfreesboro and Easton Elementary, as well as Miss Mahoney's group in Lynn Haven, they also say football field. Now, it's interesting because we held this webinar yesterday and we did not get this type of answer that all of you seem to agree on. They all say a football field, Will, so are they right? <laughs> well, they're all right, yes. <laughs> it, is, it is indeed the size of a football field. Um, and here we have, this is one of our little favorite graphics that show that, along with a lot of facts about the International Space Station. We, we won't go through all of them. But on the left, there's some of the most important ones when we think about how we do remote sensing from the International Space Station. First of all, uh, it's the orbit of the International Space Station is different from most other orbital sensors. We'll talk about that in a minute in more detail. Uh, but it also, uh, some interesting facts about how high it orbits. It's at about 240 miles above the surface of the Earth, or 386 kilometers if you're studying the metric system. It travels around the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour, which is pretty fast. Uh, when you think most of your most of your cars on highways, you might go 65 to 75 miles per hour. Uh, the ISS travels, you know, roughly a thousand times faster than that, and uh, that allows the ISS to to go, go around the Earth 16 times a day. So the crew on the ISS gets to see 16 sunrises and sunsets, which I think is kind of a cool thing to think about. Now, as we move a little f uh, forward and talk more about this orbit. So the ISS orbit, as you can see from the graphic on your screen right now, 
it's inclined because if you think of the Earth rotating and think of it as like a top standing on its edge, you notice that the ISS orbit is going at an angle around the Earth. That's what we call an inclined equatorial orbit. Most other remote sensing instruments on satellites in orbit have what's called a polar orbit. In other words, that orbit would look straight up and down on this graphic. They go over both poles of the Earth. And that allows those satellites to collect very regular data at about a 12 to 14 day repeat period because those satellites are designed so that they track the sun. Uh, they only they collect data over the same spot on the Earth at a, the same sun position every time. That's why they only have a 12 to 14 day repeat period. Um, the ISS, on the other hand, because of this inclined orbit, it doesn't track the sun. So what that means is the ISS can pass over the same spot on the Earth at different times of the day. So the ISS might pass over it when the sun is, is in the morning uh, or the afternoon or late afternoon, and frequently the ISS will pass over a spot on the Earth at, at, during the nighttime. So this makes it uh, a fundamentally different kind of remotely sensed data collection than you have from many of the other satellites in orbit. Now, the, the ISS orbit uh, allows this, uh, the way the sun works is the ISS will pass over the same spot with approximately the same sun conditions on a three to four day period. So you can collect very similar data for a three to four day period, but then you have to wait two to three months for the orbit to come around again to where you can get that same kind of data. You might be able to get uh, nighttime data or data at other times of day over the same spot on the Earth. Uh, but if you want similar data collected with the same illumination, you have to wait uh, two to three months. And then you'll have another three to four day period we, where you can collect similar data. On to our next slide. Here's a graphic that shows uh, a lot of the current and planned Earth science instruments on the outside of the space station. And because we're NASA, we, we love to abbreviate things. So all of these have their own little acronyms or shorthand for what the instrument is. And we'll talk about a few of these as we go, both in internal and external sensors. But this is to give you an idea of the various spots that we can mount sensors on the ISS. So we'll look at imagery from three of these sensors, three of the NASA sensors. We, we won't talk about any of the, uh, the international partner sensors. We'll just focus on NASA today. And we'll start off with uh, the crewed sensor facility, the Crew Earth Observations Facility. And this is astronauts using handheld digital cameras to take imagery out of the windows on the ISS. And here, we're looking at uh, Italian astronaut, ESA astronaut, uh, Luca Parmitano, and he's getting ready to take some imagery out of, whoops, sorry, let me get back there, out of the, uh, the cupola, which is the observational dome on the bottom of the space station that enables us to look at the Earth's surface and parts of the ISS at the same time. You note a couple things about this. First of all, he's, uh, he looks pretty comfortable. He's in a short sleeve shirt. And that's, that's an advantage of, of having the inside of the ISS available, is that the astronauts can be in a short, a short sleeve environment. You also see that he has this giant lens on this camera. This, is, uh, this enables the astronauts to take very highly detailed, very high resolution imagery of the Earth's surface. And that's what we're showing here on the left side. This is a graphic that kind of shows you the trade-off between lens size and detail on the ground. If you're using a pretty short lens, which is if any of you are, are uh, photographers or maybe your parents are photographers, uh, they, you've probably seen the lenses they have on their cameras if they're still using uh, cameras and not the cameras in their smartphones. You'll see with a short lens, that enables you to get a pretty big chunk of the Earth's surface, a big footprint, but at fairly low detail levels. If you use a very long lens, like the kind Luca is using in the photograph on the right, you'll see that you can get, you get a very small footprint on the Earth, but you get very detailed imagery in that footprint. And so this is the trade-off that we use, and we ask astronauts for both, both highly detailed imagery with small footprints and very large footprint imagery with short lenses. Uh, and again, this is taken from inside the space station. And uh, the astronauts provide targets, or sorry, the astronauts get targets on a daily basis uh, by my group, generated by my group here, that corresponds to both science requests for new data and also uh, educational requests for student groups like yourself. The next uh, system that we'll talk about is, this is a very long name for this, uh, the ISS Severe Environmental Research and Visualization System Pathfinder, or ISERV for short. 
this is also inside the space station. Uh, this is something that a camera system that's developed from taking a digital camera and fusing it with a astronomical telescope. And if any of you are, are amateur astronomers or perhaps your parents are, you may recognize this kind of telescope. Uh, this is very similar to the kind of telescope that you can buy yourself and use at home, a, a Celestron telescope. And it has the advantages of having a motorized mount. And so when you put the camera, and you don't see it here in this photo, but when you put the digital camera on the end, you can use the magnification power of the telescope to get very, very detailed imagery of the ground surface. This sensor is commanded from the ground. So once, once the astronauts either put it in or take it out of this facility called the Window Observational Research Facility, or WARF, which is on the inside of the space station, the, the ground crew can then command it to point using the base here at whatever target they want on the surface of the Earth. If you look at this image in the background, you see this porthole. That's an actual window in the U.S. Destiny Lab module that looks down onto the Earth's surface, and that's what ISERV takes its imagery through. On the left, you see Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield uh, floating in the space station with the ISERV sensor, and he's just about to reinstall this back into the wharf enclosure facility. So here, astronauts, again, take this in, take it out, but otherwise they don't interact with the system. Now, the last sensor that we're going to talk about, this is the hyperspectral imager for the coastal ocean, or the HICO. And what this is, this is a, a more sophisticated type of sensor that we call hyperspectral. And all that means is it takes much more detailed information of the light energy that's coming up from the ground surface, or in this case, ocean surface, up to the sensor. Our eyes are only really sensitive to three colors, or three wavelengths of light, red, green, and blue. And we, our eyes are very good at looking at gradations between those three wavelengths, but there's a lot of information at other parts of the light wavelength spectrum that our eyes aren't sensitive to, in particular, the near-infrared wavelengths where vegetation has a lot of reflectance. You can get a lot of information from vegetation in those areas. So what the HICO sensor does is it is sensitive to those wavelength areas. And when you, you look at the data that the HICO collects, you can produce these what are called spectra. You can think of them as fingerprints of different materials on the Earth's surface. In this case, the one you're looking at, this is a scene of, of my area, my part of the world, Gallison Bay in Texas uh, near Houston. And we're looking at vegetation near in the east side of the Galveston Bay area. And this is a very typical fingerprint or spectrum for vegetation. Uh, scientists use this kind of data specifically to look at coastal areas. And they're looking at things like how the coastlines change over time, what kind of materials are found on the coastlines, and what kind of uh, things like plankton uh, can be visible in the topmost part of the ocean. On the right-hand side, this is an image of the HICO sensor mounted on the outside of the Japan Experiment uh, Module, or the GEMEF. And right here you see the gold mylar covered enclosure that has the HICO in it. And so what it does is it looks down on the Earth's surface from the outside of the space station. Unfortunately, this sensor is currently offline. And uh, both the NASA teams and the Naval Research Laboratory, who actually built this sensor, were actively trying to recover the sensor. But right now it is offline. So one question to think about before we go on is I mentioned that you know, the other two sensors that we talked about are inside the space station, but this one's on the outside of the space station. So just think a little bit about, I don't think you need to answer us, uh, you don't need to provide answers, but you know, think about how the scientific instrument gets installed on the outside of the ISS. And so we do actually have some groups that have started to put in some answers, and the Rice School right away, as well as Murfreesboro School, says that it's probably done by astronauts uh, during a spacewalk. Uh, and Lynn Haven Elementary and, the, and Ms. Stafford's group says a space ball, uh, which is an interesting type of thing, as well as the possibility of docking uh, from Miss Ackerland's class there in Lynn Haven. Uh, and this HICO instrument would, would certainly be used to sort of look at their area as they're sort of very close to the coastline there. But now Jack Barnes has said that they get plugged into the ISS and they go out to install it, talking about the, uh, the astronauts. 
And one of the Lynn Haven groups, I think that's Miss Worcester's group, has said possibly a robotic arm, as does Smith Elementary. So with those great answers, Will, how does this get installed? Okay. Uh, the answer, yes, in, in some cases, uh, astronauts will go out and install an instrument. Uh, but typically what's done nowadays is to use uh, robotic arms to install sensors on the exterior. And so what you're seeing here is an animation of the ISS Rapid Scat instrument being installed on the outside of the Columbus module. That's the module that the European Space Agency provided to the International Space Station. So the robotic arm is run by astronauts inside the space station, uh, but the astronauts themselves don't go out and do this. And most of the sensors that are going on board the, the ISS now and being planned for the future are designed specifically so they can be they can be installed by this method. So we don't need to have astronauts go out and uh, do do extra extravehicular activities to go uh, to go mount the sensors themselves. So what you're seeing now, this is a, another graphic that shows the ISS as if it were flying directly above you. So you're looking upwards at the bottom of the space station. And what we're showing here are these are the various spots where we have sensors mounted and where we can take uh, imagery through windows on the space station. So here you have the Columbus module. We have sensors mounted on the exterior of that module here. You have the GEMS, is the Japan Experiment Module, and its exposed facility, the GEM-EF, which we refer to as the back porch. And this is where the HICO is mounted, and this is where many other sensors will be mounted in the future. The destiny module here, this is the US, one of the US modules, and this is the window that I pointed out in the picture of the ISERV. That's the window that the sensor is actually looking through. Oops. And here, this is the cupola that we mentioned in the picture of Luca Parmitano. This is where he, he was taking an image out of that. We also have a couple of windows in the Russian part of the space station in the Zvezda service module. These are two windows that the astronauts frequently use to take high resolution astronaut photography out of. So many areas that, that you can view the Earth from the ISS, both from the interior and the exterior of the station. So, which brings us to our next question. Uh, what do you think is a better method for capturing imagery of natural disasters from the ISS? Using humans to take imagery or using uh, ground-commanded remote sensing instruments? And why do you think? You know, explain your answer. So think about that, give us your answer, but don't forget the most important part of the question, the why, and we'll let you think and we'll stand by for some answers. All right, so we have a few answers coming in from the Rice School. They're saying remote sensing sensors because they're more accurate. Lynn Haven is saying that the possibility of um, safer and more accurate, and we are talking about human imagery from space, not necessarily from the ground. Uh, so uh, Lynn Haven and Ms. Worcester's class is saying remote sensors will rule out human error, and humans can certainly make errors or miss something, as Murfreesboro Middle School has mentioned. Uh, Smith Elementary says both, because humans can actually aim where they want to look. Remote sensing might provide higher resolution. Very interesting answer, Smith Elementary. Jack Barnes from, Al from Arizona says humans because they can't man malfunction and they can be very accurate. And Ms. Ackerland's class is also saying that humans can control where the remote sensors go and they can get pictures of lots of different spots without being there. And also to have a middle school here in Texas says we believe remote sensing sensors, that's their choice. Technology is or can be better and less potential for error. And some other things, ruling out human errors, but humans also, as Alan P. Shepard Middle School says, that humans can get a quick look uh, and uh, maybe capture things uh, that, uh, that someone doesn't want to miss, like, like something Will might talk about here in a minute. 
Yeah, th these are all great answers, and and yes, I, I, my answer to this would be would be both. Uh, each each have their own part to play and their strengths for for uh, for remote sensing. Uh, as many people have said, yes, uh, the human element is very important because it does allow both uh, the the human to aim the camera where they want to go, whereas the ground commanded systems you typically have to have to command them ahead of time. They don't have really good real-time response. And humans can also notice something going on that might not be anticipated by the, the, uh, the ground command sensors. On the other hand, as, as several folks have said, the, the ground commanded sensors typically are more sophisticated, so they collect, in many cases, uh, better data or uh, certainly more information that can be used to understand what, what's in the image, what's going on with the disaster or the natural hazard being observed. But, so, but really, the, the, I'd say the, the best answer is that both are useful, depending on the situation and depending on what kind of information you need. And here's one example specifically for the human, the human end of things. Uh, this is a, an astronaut photograph that was collected by astronaut Jeff Williams of Cleveland volcano in the Aleutian Island chain erupting. Now, he just the ISS happened to be over this particular spot, and he looked out the window and saw this happening. He actually saw the eruption beginning, its, its original stages. And what he did is he, he quite literally called down to the United States Geological Survey, which is the, the U.S. agency that monitors volcanoes, and told them, told them, hey, I see a volcano erupting in the Aleutians. Are you aware of it? And they had not been aware of it because at the time, this particular volcano was not heavily monitored by by the U.S. Geological Survey. It hadn't it hadn't had a serious eruption for some time, uh, and so once he convinced them that he was in fact calling from the International International Space Station and he was seeing it from space, they then began to look themselves and look at their their observational uh, assets, and they confirmed that why well, yes you're right it is erupting, and the eruption was powerful enough. That it could have it could have posed a danger to aircraft flying over. So since that time, they have now instrumented that volcano a lot more densely than they had before. So this is a good example of a case where having a human in orbit was uh, was a very good asset. It was able to see an event as it was occurring, whereas the robotic sensors weren't programmed to see this, uh, and so they might not have caught it. So now let's move on and talk a little bit about some of these hazards in a little bit more detail. So volcanoes, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a geologist and I, I tend to study, I, I'm, volcanoes are, I won't say one of my favorite hazards, but it's a hazard I find particularly interesting. Uh, and on the left, here you see a graphic which shows a lot of the many different hazards that are associated with volcanoes. You have the eruption cloud, which can drop ash on areas. You have large uh, ejected rocks and hot magma, or lava as, as it's called when it actually erupts. Uh, bombs, you have uh, pyroclastic flows, which are superheated gas clouds composed of, of fine particulates, superheated gases, which can travel very fast down the slope of the volcano and have been the, the, uh, the causes of quite a lot of damage and loss of life in volcanic eruptions to nearby cities. Lava flows, of course. You can also have avalanches, which occur as a result of the eruption, uh, and uh, sort of fissures which, are, which can form as well. On the right-hand side, you have a couple of images which illustrate some of these hazards on the ground. On the upper left, excuse me, upper right, you have uh, a lava flow which completely engulfed the Wahaula Visitor Center in 1989, uh, setting the whole thing on fire. As I mentioned earlier, the, the eruptions, the lava flows from Hawaii may not, may not always flow very fast, but they flow sort of irresistibly. And you can't really stop them, so whatever's in their path will be affected by the lava flow. On the lower right, here you see uh, an image of an area near Rubal Caldera in Papua New Guinea. And here you see the results of ash deposition falling of an explosive volcanic eruption. All this material that you see here, that's ash that fell out of an eruption cloud. And you see where it's essentially collapsed this house because of the great weight of the ash. So you can think of it as a heavy snowfall, but much heavier and much harder to deal with. And this is the kind of uh, hazard that you face quite frequently from explosive volcanic eruptions. This next graphic shows uh, an image uh, of a plot of active volcanoes around the world. 
and known volcanoes around the world, not necessarily active, but known to have been active in recent times. And the white bars show the limits of the ISS orbit as, predict as projected on the ground. So you can see from this graphic that the ISS passes over quite a few uh, of the active volcanoes on the Earth's surface. So therefore, it's a useful platform for tracking volcanic eruptions and looking at that particular volcanic hazard. This next image shows an eruption, an animation of images taken from the National Space Station. Again, this is crew, crew handheld photography of the Sarachev Peak eruption. This occurred in the Kuril Islands. And here, this is a very classic explosive eruption, but it has a very interesting feature that was captured. This that you see pointed out by the black arrow is something called a pileus cloud. And this is formed when you have a very rapid eruption that pushes air up over the volcano into higher levels of the atmosphere, causing the water in it to condense very rapidly. So you form this white cloud. And while this kind of phenomena had been seen before from the ground and from airplanes, this was the first time it had been viewed from orbit. And so this particular image and sequence of images caused quite a stir in the volcanological community. What you also see here is one of these pyroclastic flows, a pyroclastic cloud traveling down the slope of the volcano as opposed to the other uh, material which is being pushed upwards by the volcanic eruption. Again, these can be highly dangerous because uh, they can travel very fast, hundreds of miles per hour down the volcano, far faster than anyone can run to get away from it. Uh, and these were take, these are fairly detailed images taken with a 400 millimeter lens. And just an illustration of the kind of data you can collect from the ISS for use in the volcanic uh, hazard type of study. This is a, a more recent shot taken by the ICERV instrument of Mount Sinabung volcano, which has been re very recently active in Indonesia. Now this is, it's hard to see the actual volcano, the volcanic cone itself, but you can see some recent deposits. You can see lava flows and you can see ash deposits. And the ash deposits are recognizable because most of the area around here is sort of green covered with vegetation except for the area recently covered by deposits from the volcano. And these are two things that you can actually use to look for recent volcanic activity. Uh, changes to the land surface, things like lava flows, things like ash deposits. And in that case, it helps to have a series of images. So you can see, see uh, have before and after shots. And here's perhaps a much more obvious example of how lava flows can be used to track volcanic activity. Here's an astronaut photograph of lava flows on Mauna Loa volcano, uh, in Hawaii, taken in 2007. And here you can see the, vo the lava flows are very, very evident. And here you can actually track the age of the volcano or the volcanic activity by the freshness of the lava flow. These black, very dark flows are relatively recent, whereas older flows are becoming more weathered. They've been exposed for a longer amount of time, so they tend to be a little more light colored. They start to match more of the background of the volcanic structure itself. So moving on to our next class of, of hazards that we're gonna talk about, tropical cyclones and flooding. Now, tropical cyclones uh, occur in all of the world's oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean, every year as equatorial wind patterns change and the ocean warms. So it's a, it's a hazard that occurs on a very regular basis, and as such, we know quite a lot about how they form now, to the point where we've developed really good tools for being able to predict uh, when a hurricane or a tropical cyclone is going to form and where it's going to go what we don't really have a good handle on still is how powerful the storm is going to be. So what you see in this animation here on the left, this is an animation of uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, which grew into a huge storm before it made landfall took right over New Orleans and caused quite a lot of damage to that city and the surrounding area, really the whole northern Gulf of Mexico. And that resulted in quite a lot of damage. Uh, there's a lot of populations on the coast, a lot of building that still goes on along coastlines around the world. And so that puts a lot of property and people at risk from these, these, high, from these tropical cyclones due to their high winds, the storm surge from, from the, uh, the wind being, pushing water up onto the coastline, high precipitation and flooding that can occur as a result of these storms, and sometimes tornadoes that are spawned as a result of these, these storms. Also, you have the storm itself, but you also have the loss of power and services that typically occurs when these storms make landfall. And that can lead to further, further damage or loss of life because people don't have power uh, for heating or cooling. Um, 
And you can see here I've listed a few recent storms, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ike, uh, Superstorm Sandy, and you can see how much damage these have caused, uh, billions of dollars and thousands to hundreds of fatalities. So that this, is, this is a very, uh, a very uh, important kind of hazard to understand, particularly for people living in coastal areas. Now, I mentioned storm surge. This graphic at the right kind of illustrates what we mean by storm surge, if you're not familiar. Here you've got typical sea level, the normal level of the, of the ocean, and high tide might push that sea level up to the point where you're getting close to a house built along the coast. But then if you add the storm on top of that, this water being pushed towards the shoreline by the winds of the storm, that results in what we call the storm surge. As you can see from this graphic, that storm surge can be quite high, and this is where you tend to have most of your flooding and damage from the storm. You know, if you build your house up here, high ground, you want to build it high enough so that you, you can get away from most of this storm surge. Now, how is the ISS useful for this kind of, this kind of hazard? Well, the ISS views, can view both the storm structure, clouds, eyes of the storm, and the aftermath flooding. And we can also collect uh, Im flooding images from things that aren't necessarily storms, just high precipitation events. A storm system that sits over an area and just dumps a lot of water in a very short amount of time or a lot of water over an extended period of time, causing rivers to flood uh, and, and large-scale damage to areas around the river. We can collect that data as well. And we have two new sensors going up, the ISS Rapid Scat, which actually is already on the, on the space station and functional, and the Cloud Aerosol Transport System, both of which will provide new views of storm systems and atmospheric processes. Let's take a look at some data from, uh, from these large storm systems. Here you have two, uh, two hurricanes that occurred in 2010, Hurricane Igor and Hurricane Earl. And the first image that you have here in the upper left, this is a detailed image of the hurricane eye structure. This is the center of the storm. On the lower left, you have a much more sort of perspective view of the whole storm system, including the outer storm bands. On the upper right, you have an astronaut photograph of the Biloxi, Mississippi area after Hurricane Katrina went through. And here you see areas pointed out of flooding, also an area where the US-90 bridge was completely washed out and destroyed because of the storm surge. That's a comparison to an earlier Landsat image here where you see the bridge fully functional and uh, no real flooding in the areas up here. So our question for you now, looking at these two images in particular, what type of view do you think is better for observing hurricanes from space? Kind of more of a directly overhead view, which you would call a nadir view, or more of a perspective view where you can see the whole storm. And as always, please explain your answer. So we'll give you a few minutes to think about that and see what answers come in. So we have some answers coming in. Lynn Haven in Miss Worcester's class is saying an overview to be able to see the eye and all around it. Uh, Rice School did make the notation that different lenses are certainly used for both of these images, so that also can provide some variety of information. Miss Ackerland's group says uh, that depends on what you want to look at, um, which is a really good point. Uh, Ms. Stafford there at Lynn Haven says directly overhead because you might be able to tell more about the storm. Smith Elementary is saying the both because you can get different views from different angles depending on the information you are looking for. Now our group in Easton Elementary and they're in Maine, I don't know if they were hit by Superstorm Sandy, but they said the side view allows for a bigger view of the storm. And Murfreesboro in Illinois, and I don't think you get hit all that often, but if you were, um, looking at what you are saying here depends on what you are studying and looking for. As well as Alan B. Shepard, you might be able to see the height and other details of the storm if you're looking at a side view. And Jack Barnes says the top view because you can almost see inside that hurricane. What I love about these, these answers, Will, is they're really giving some insight as to what types of things you might be able to see, why, and they're really explaining their answers, all of them. What do you think? Yeah, thanks, Paige, and I agree. They're all great answers. 
And the and I would say yes. The the answer is both. Uh, it, it does depend on what what particular part of the storm structure you're still looking at. In some cases, the downward view into the eye provides very useful data for that part of the storm. But the side views, the more panoramic large views, also provide information on how the outer storm bands form. So it really is a matter of both views being useful depending on what questions you're asking and what kind of uh, process you're interested in figuring out. And this is exactly part of, part of science. It's a, you you kind of have to really know what kind of question you're, you're asking and what data you need to answer that question. So again, great answers uh, for, this, for this question. So moving on, now we have uh, uh, kind of a different sort of image. This is from the iServe camera. And this is an image of flooding that took place uh, in the city of Calgary in Alberta, Canada in last year, June of 2013. And this is one of those large precipitation events. This wasn't the result of a storm, like a hurricane or a typhoon, but uh, a large weather system that came through and just dumped a huge amount of uh, rain on the ground surface in the watershed, which caused the rivers around Calgary to flood. And what you have here is you've got, this is actually a map that was built on the iServe data in the background here. All these red areas show spots where the flooding was particularly bad and damage was particularly bad. This image was, was collected from the ISS and sent to the response agencies in Canada, particularly the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and it provided very useful data to help them identify where they needed to send uh, resources to both help people and help deal with the flooding. So this is a really good example of how ISS data is used for disaster response for this kind of hazard. Here's a few more images from the ISS that show other types of flooding. Uh, up in the upper left here, this is an image that was taken after the, the Tohoku earthquake in 2011 uh, off the coast of Japan. Now this, this earthquake spawned a fairly large tsunami that then impacted the, the coastline of Japan and flooded quite a few areas. And you can see the flood waters very well delineated here. Um, this image is gray. Everything looks kind of gray here because what you're seeing is what's called sun glint. This is a reflection off the water surface of sunlight back to the sensor, in this case, back to the International Space Station. On the right, this is flooding in that same year that occurred along the Mississippi River in Missouri and Tennessee. And here you can see the normal channel of the, Missouri, of the Mississippi River. Uh, but around it, you see a lot of these agricultural fields, which are completely covered, and almost completely covered, in brown, muddy water. And that's because since the water was flowing so high, it carried a lot of sediment from the surrounding area, and that's what made it brown. In the bottom, here you have a Heiko image. This is of coastal India, taken after the passage of Typhoon Feilin in October of 2013. And here you can see this river along the right side of the image you could see that it's also very brown because it's carrying a lot of sediment. It's also very swollen. Uh, the river is very, very evident in this image because it's carrying so much water. So our question here is, can you identify any colors or patterns in this kind of imagery from the ISS that might help you uh, indicate what areas have been flooded? So in the chat window, and this will try to get just a few answers because we know we're getting close to uh, some time limits here, but colors, patterns, and I noticed Murfreesboro Middle School is saying Mississippi is flooding something that they have to deal with there in Illinois, and they are studying flooding, and Murfreesboro has a request uh, for imagery uh, waiting to come down from the space station. But we're looking at also some other answers. Ms. Mahoney saying very brown because it's carrying a lot of soil and sediment. Excellent answer. Uh, Rice School is saying brown water and again dealing with the set sediments. Alan B. Shepard is saying grays and browns where the flood waters have moved. Ms. Ackerland also agrees this muddy colored brown water also is indicative of some flooding, and there might be more answers coming in, and Murfreesboro does mention river flooding is brown because of erosion of the banks, and again, something they're looking at at the Big Muddy River in their area. So, Will, not to cut off these answers coming in, but do you agree? Yes, yes, again, all, all great answers. Uh, and in many cases, particularly right after the precipitation event, yeah, uh, the, when rivers are carrying more sediment because it's been washed off the land surface, yeah, brown water, brown water and areas that are covered with brown water are usually a pretty good indication uh, that an area is flooded. 
Also, going back to that image of Japan, the sun glint is, can also be a very useful tool because as the water surface sits on the, as the water surface is illuminated by the sun, it acts almost like a mirror. And so it can really highlight a lot of areas where standing water is present that might not be uh, immediately uh, visible, particularly if it's something from flooding like a tsunami, where you might not have sediment per se, since the water's been washed up from the ocean surface. So again, all good answers. And we'll move forward now to our next topic. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I just want you all to know that there is an international agreement called the International Disaster Charter, which uh, governs data collection for hazard response. And what this, what this whole arrangement really, really is set up to do is it's set up for, to collect data for countries that don't have the ability uh, to collect remotely sensed data from orbit themselves. Many countries around the world, like, like the US, uh, Russia, Japan, the European Space Agency, uh, we have remote sensing instruments in orbit around the Earth, both on just uh, free-flying satellites and the International Space Station. And we're able to collect data around the world in response to a natural hazard or disaster. But there are many other countries that don't have that kind of ability. So what this agreement does, it basically says, when we can, we'll collect data from our instruments and provide it to you uh, free for use uh, so you, to help in your disaster response. And so this is something that the ISS became a part of, or rather the sensors on the ISS became a part of in 2012. And since that time, we have collected data for 32 disaster response events. What you're seeing now is a map that shows, since the International Space Station has been involved in this, just the, the spread, the geographic spread, and areas that have been hit by natural disasters since 20, 2012 up to the present day. And they're color-coded for the different type of disaster. In some areas, you see a number, and this just indicates that there are multiple disaster events that have occurred there. Now, the ISS hasn't necessarily collected data for all of these, these events, but our sensors were at least notified of them. And when they could collect data, they did, as I said, for 32 of these events. So some takeaways from this webinar. Uh, you've, you've heard a lot of stuff, a lot of information, uh, but the main things that, that I think are important for you to take away is that the International Space Station provides uh, a unique capability for remote sensing of the Earth and for disaster response for two reasons. One, because it has a, a different orbit, which enable, enables it to see different parts of the Earth at different times than the other orbital satellites can. It has humans on board in addition to ground commanded sensors, so you have the advantages of, of humans being able to make decisions on the fly uh, on their own initiative and you also have the ability to collect more sophisticated data from the other remote sensing systems. Uh, the data that we collect is useful for both understanding the natural processes, so we can look at how volcanic eruptions occur, we can look at how storms develop and change over time from the data from the ISS. We can also use the data collected to map the effects of the natural disasters, and that's really the intent of the International Disaster Charter. We've talked really about three main types of hazards, volcanoes, tropical cyclones, and flooding. Uh, but we've also realized that the ISS data can be used to look at many other types of natural hazards, including things like wildfires uh, and things of that nature. And the ISS, it's a useful contributor to the natural disaster response. You know, we, we have provided data to requesting countries for a number of, uh, of different hazards. So it is, it is a useful platform to collect this data from. With that, I'll turn, turn it back over to Paige. Yeah, to just sort of mention that although, as Willis talked about, scientists, and he even mentioned this earlier, scientists use that data and request data from the International Space Station as part of their research, but you as a class can also study natural disasters using imagery from space and even requesting to have an astronaut pick up a camera on your behalf for part of your research. And so this next slide just shows what you would need to think about if you wanted to put in a new data request. One of those things would be choosing a topic of interest. Are you interested in hurricanes or volcanoes or flooding or something else? Knowing we're going to be trying to capture imagery related to hazards and natural disasters, you can, in number two here, frame a question, come up with a question that you can ask and answer 
utilizing this true Earth observation imagery from space. Thirdly, it is important to plan, if you're going to ask a question, how can you use the data you're requesting to answer that question? And that certainly is something that all scientists think about as they do their own research. And fourthly, if you can do all of that, you can work with your teacher, put together and submit your data request, again, to have an astronaut pick up a camera on your behalf. And Murfreesboro Middle School has a request pending, as well as Jack Barnes. They have a sister school, Queen Creek Elementary, that's also waiting for some imagery. So you, too, can put together a research investigation to participate in this as well. So with that, we are at the top of the hour. And first of all, I want to thank Will for his sharing of his knowledge and his expertise and information with all of you students out there. Will has a wealth of knowledge, and he has shared so much of that with you, and we sure hope it has enhanced some of the things you might be studying in school, whether it's light, light energy, the electromagnetic spectrum, volcanoes, hazards, you name it. I think Will got it into this webinar. So thank you, Will, for joining us and sharing this with us today. My pleasure. And thank you students and groups that have been on the line for your participation as well. It's been really great to have your answers to questions. And I know you have some additional questions. So we're actually going to share Will with us um, using our little camera here. You can see Will on the screen there. So now you know what Will really looks like in person. Uh, and uh, I know that. For some of you, it is the top of the hour, so you may need to actually depart. Uh, but for those of you that can stay on the line, Will has agreed to, to stay with us for a few extra minutes to answer some questions. So we appreciate you thanking us in the window there. Uh, and we definitely have some questions that have already been asked, Will. So I'm going to start. Uh, and again, if you do need to depart, Thank you so much for joining us. This is our last webinar for this, for this year, for this calendar year, but we hope to have some additional webinars uh, after the new year. So again, thank you for joining us today. If you have to depart, we look forward to connecting with you again in the future. Now let's get to some Q&A. So Will, I'm going to start with uh, a question that came in from the Rice School here in Texas, and they wanted to know how long are astronauts on the ISS? Well, it, it depends. Uh, some astronauts are on board for uh, three months. Some astronauts are on board for six months, uh, depending on what their crew rotation is. Uh, we're currently planning uh, to have a couple of astronauts on board for an entire year. Uh, and that's specifically to start looking at how long duration uh, exposure to microgravity might affect astronauts going on a, on a mission to Mars. So it's, it, it can be variable, uh, depending on the astronaut and where they are in the crew rotation. And is there an astronaut that will be going up for some long term or a set of twins that they will actually do mm -hmm. some uh, studies with? Yes, that's uh, astronaut Scott Kelly uh, will be going up uh, because his, his brother, his twin, uh, has retired from the astronaut corps. But, so he's on Earth, so they're going to track over a year the differences that occur to them physically while one of them is in space, or one of them is in microgravity, and the other is here on Earth. Very, very interesting. Now, another question, a little less related to the ISS, but a question came up from Smith um, School in Delaware, and they were interested if you have any information you can share with them on the temperatures of lava. How hot, or what's the hottest temperatures? How hot is this lava? Well, the hottest, the hottest lavas uh, can get up to about 2,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and that's, that's enough to melt uh, the mineral quartz, which is one of the most common minerals uh, in the Earth's crust. And depending on the kind of lava it is, they can go down a little bit in temperature, but it's, it's pretty much up around the thousands, thousands of degrees. So enough to pretty much melt almost anything it comes in contact with or, or set it on fire. And, you know, it's interesting because I know that in Hawaii there has been uh, some lava that has been threatening some of the local towns there. You mentioned, you know, that this lava, it, it, it 
doesn't travel all that fast sometimes, but it is something you just can't stop. And has there been any imagery collected from some of these lava flows in Hawaii? Uh, yes, there has been. Uh, we, we do collect data over the Hawaiian Islands pretty frequently. Um, and we do have, in some areas, you can see where these lava flows have, have gone through and, and kind of burned away the vegetation. Uh, I mean, the, the lava flows coming off the big volcano uh, is really the most easily seen, but you can see some of these other lava flows and some of the other imagery. All right, so we have another question or a question from Jack Barnes Elementary, and they are wondering how long did it take for the ISS to get into space or be built in space is probably more of a, a, of a description. Well, it took, it took about 12 years to get all the parts in orbit and get it to the point where, where NASA and our international partners declared the ISS to be fully constructed. Uh, we're now moving away from a construction phase to now using the ISS, what we're calling assembly complete. And the ISS was, was brought up in a series of stages, brought up in pieces, because there's no way, we don't have any capability to lift something as big as the completed ISS into orbit in one shot. So over those 12 years, uh, various modules and parts of the ISS were brought up on space shuttle flights and assembled in orbit into the full station that we now have. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, and construction is complete, so we are on science mode, so that's really great. Now, Lynn Haven Elementary, Miss Mahoney's class actually over there, she said that, uh, or their group is saying, I know you said it was hard to observe earthquakes, but what can you tell related to earthquakes from the ISS? Well, what we would usually do from the ISS is, as I said, if the earthquake spawns a tsunami or a big flood event, that's something that you can typically see with the sensors we currently have on the ISS. Um, if once we, if we get to the point where we're, we have fully operational, very high resolution sensors, uh, like one of the sensors that's currently on, or being built on the Russian side of the, the, of the ISS called EarthCast, that will enable us to get much more detailed information. If the earthquake is big enough, if it causes enough damage, say, to a, to a city area, then you might be able to see some of the damage that was caused by the earthquake. But generally speaking, unless it's a huge earthquake that causes either extensive damage or a very big, very obvious rupture in the Earth's surface, uh, it's just very hard to see definitive changes from, resulting from the earthquake. I mean, you might be able to see things that you think might be a result of the earthquake, but it's hard to definitively say that, yes, that was caused by the earthquake. Excellent. That was a really excellent question there from that group. Now, you talked about IDC, Will, and one of the groups, the Rice School, actually wondered how many organizations are a part of this International Disaster Charter, or IDC? Let's see. I think at the moment the current count is probably about 12. I, can, uh, I, can, I don't know if I can go back to my slide here and see. We can, we can count. So while Will has disappeared from the camera view, he's actually looking back to his slide where he was showing uh, that graphic uh, that had the Earth and a bunch of different organizations around it. So he's literally counting right now. Oh, almost, got, got close, 15, 15 different organizations right now. Awesome. Now let's see if I can get back to uh, our camera. Just so that we can see Will rather than a blank screen. Let me try to do this and share our camera. There we go. Uh, so uh, we had a couple of other questions. Now, uh, let's see. Jack Barnes Elementary is actually asking a really interesting and somewhat of a, you know, more directed towards you, Will, of, you know, what's the best part of studying rocks and being a geologist? Well, one, one is the ability to, to go outside <laughs> and, uh, and wander around and, and get paid for it. Um, but I think probably for me, uh, one of the most exciting things about being a geologist is you learn the ability to kind of read the landscape. And you can do this either on the ground or using remotely sensed data. It's, it's just, for me, it's kind of a neat feeling knowing that I could be dropped anywhere on the surface of the earth 
And just by looking around and kind of thinking about what I'm seeing, I can get a sense of, of how that landscape has developed and what the history is there. So it's uh, in some ways, it's kind of like being able to speak a language. Um, and so it, I think for me, that's, that's one of the, the best things about being a geologist. And you know, it is a really interesting question and, and Will's first part of his answer. You know, we're sitting here in an office and you got, you, all of you out in your schools and classrooms, you sit in your classrooms each day and there's this just amazing outside world that when you can go out and investigate and have that be what you do as part of your career, that gets you outside, it gets you exploring and scientists and science and exploration is just an amazing part of what we can learn on a daily basis. So just getting outside and away from a computer, from a desk, and into that fresh air really is something you can make a career out of. And Will sometimes goes out in the field with astronauts to, to train them on some of his geological skills. Isn't that correct, Will? That is. That is. I, I, I haven't been getting out as much as I would like, but uh, yeah, I still get out there. So yeah, that outdoor, if, for those of you that have that outdoor spirit, maybe geology or a career in geology is something that might be good for you. Maybe you can be a geologist on Mars. So here's a question from Ms. Ackerland's group in Florida, and she said, when you look at pictures that have filters, are the filters on the camera? Are they added afterwards by a computer? Can you explain anything about that? No, that's a great question. Uh, it, it depends on the system. Uh, if you're dealing with like a handheld digital camera, uh, that system, the filters w are typically on the outside, it's on the lens. Um, we recently had an astronaut, Don Pettit, who brought a modified camera up to the ISS where he had a number of filters that he would screw onto the lens uh, to get different wavelengths of light filtered out. Other, sen other sensor designs like Heiko, the filters are actually part of the instrument itself inside the sensor. So it's not the, the, the lens that'll, that magnifies the image uh, doesn't have the filters on it. Uh, there are more recently, there are now some electronic filter designs so you don't have an actual physical filter. What you're doing is you're, you're actually manipulating the energy that comes in to the sensor itself and using that to filter out and select different wavelengths. So uh, you know, sensor design is something that's always advancing like, like the rest of technology. Uh, but again, it depends on the sophistication of the sensor as to whether or not there's physical filters in it or not. Excellent, excellent question and great answer as well. Here's a, a very interesting question, Will, from the Rice School, and, and they're wondering, are you scared that the ISS could get hit by debris in space? Ah, that is an excellent question. And, and the answer is yes. Uh, we, have, uh, we have an entire group uh, here at NASA, specifically here at Johnson Space Center, uh, that that's all they study. They study, it's, it's our orbital debris group, and what they do is they, together with uh, the U.S. Air Force, they actually track the, the thousands of pieces of space debris that are currently in orbit around the Earth, particularly in the, in the, in the orbital area that the ISS uh, sort of travels in. Um, and they keep track of, of large and small pieces of, of debris, what their orbits are, and whenever something looks like it might be coming close to the International Space Station, they notify the crew and the operations team for the ISS, and they make a decision as to whether or not the ISS, in some cases, can be boosted so its orbit can be changed to get it out of the path of a piece of orbital space debris. Or sometimes, if that's not possible, the crew can be told to, to go into one of the Soyuz capsules, uh, which can serve as a lifeboat. That's in case the ISS does get hit with something. Um, we also have a team here, which designs uh, shields, and unfortunately, I'm not. If you if you're a Star Trek fan like me, uh, they're not shields like you see in Star Trek or other or other science fiction shows. These are actual physical uh, shields built of various layers of metal that are designed to to take impacts and dissipate the energy from the impact before it can actually go through the skin of the spacecraft and cause a problem. So we we do have shields on our spacecraft. Uh, they, um, and you know maybe someday we will get to something that's energy based, but but yes, uh, orbital debris is a big concern for spacecraft in the orbit that the ISS uh, operates in. 
And our orbital debris group, for you students out there that might be interested in math, they really um, are heavily mathematically based in some of the trajectories that they look at and the orbits of some of these debris that they track over time. So, you know, for some of you math people that really excel in math, um, orbital debris is certainly something that, as Will said, there's thousands of pieces of debris out there, and we really need to make sure that we can protect our assets in space from those things. And in that group also uses remote sensing. Absolutely. From the ground, they use remote sensing to detect the larger pieces of space debris and also to help identify what kind of debris it is. And that includes radar measurements. Is that correct, yep. Will? They radar, use radar? Radar measurements and, uh, and, and multi-spectral, and, uh, multi hyperspectral remote sensing, just like we talked about for the HICO sensor on board the ISS. Excellent. So all that interconnection of remote sensing and its very valuable uses. So speaking of the International Space Station, Jack Barnes Elementary has asked what, what kinds of materials were used to create this, the space station and what powers it? Well, it's powered uh, primarily from the solar arrays, those big flat panels that you saw in the several pictures that we have. Um, that's, where the space, that's what powers the space station, it's the electrical energy generated from those solar panels. And uh, the station construction is of many of, a lot of materials that you find here on Earth. Um, steels, uh, steels, mylars, different kinds of plastics. Um, and materials specifically designed to be resistant to degradation by sunlight and solar radiation. So it's, uh, it's pretty much kind of a lot of the same materials that you would find here on Earth, just, just uh, examined and tested to make sure that they can survive in the, in the harsh environment of space. And somewhat related to um, the International Space Station and sort of its lifetime, the Rice School is wondering how long do they expect to use the ISS and have it in orbit? Well, right now, uh, NASA is planning to operate the space station at least until 2024. And there are some engineering studies which suggest that it could operate even, even as far out as 2028. Uh, after that point, then you really start to need to considering uh, the age of the station components and, and that exposure to the space environment. Uh, some of the components may need to be switched out if indeed we decide to operate it even longer than that. Awesome. Um, now, from the International Space Station, we talked a lot about Earth studies. Are there any studies of planets uh, or stars from the International Space Station at all? Uh, there have been some studies, and uh, there are some, some sensors on the books for, for, uh, for uh, astronomical observatories. That's been talked about for use in the ISS because you're above the atmosphere. Uh, we do have studies which have looked at the moon from the ISS uh, and also uh, Mercury, the transit of some of the moons of Mer uh, Mercury, excuse me, moons of Venus across the, uh, the face of, of that planet. Uh, we also have the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer experiment, which is on the exterior of the ISS, and that's been looking at cosmic radiation impacting the ISS as a means of trying to elucidate uh, the presence of dark matter uh, from the physics end of things. So it is, while we focus primarily on terrestrial remote sensing, there are a number of other different uh, astronomical uh, astrophysics and heliophysics, sun-based physics experiments that can be done on the ISS as well. So although the ISS really more focuses on the Earth, uh, planets like Mars are just a little bit too far away for us to really make observations of. And we do have, I saw that Harmony Hills Elementary had asked about how long it takes to get to Mars, and our robotic spacecraft that are sent to Mars can get to Mars in seven to nine months. Uh, so that tells you it's quite a distance away from the Earth or even from the location where the International Space Station is traveling. So robotically, uh, we can send different spacecraft to Mars, but the ISS certainly is, is much more of a close to home. We're investigating our Earth through the use of the ISS. Now, Will, here's a question that's actually not necessarily, as we sort of get ready to bring this to a close, and knowing that you know we, we focus more on the Earth with the ISS than we do these other planetary worlds, um, here's a question directed uh, for you, Will, in terms of what, what's your favorite part 
of what you do on a daily basis? If you could say your best part of your of the work you do, what would that be? Well, I would have to say right now it's it's, uh, it's really helping to develop the International Space Station for remote sensing. I mean, my, my major research focus is, is the Earth, not so much other planetary bodies. So I'm very interested in particular how humans are changing the surface of the Earth. Um, we, you know, we have become kind of the dominant force shaping the Earth's surface and modifying how the Earth's surface works, you know, how Earth's surface processes work. So having the ISS available uh, together with the other remote sensing instruments and being able to both track how those changes are occurring and being able to understand better how humans are changing those processes uh, is really important to me. And I think that's one of the, the things that gives me the most satisfaction of being involved with the International Space Station program you know, at this point in time. Well, that, and I know one of the favorite parts of my job is being able to bring people like Will to you students in the classroom so he can share that passion, again, share that knowledge and expertise uh, and, and further the research or have you all out there help, you know, further the research that's being done from the International Space Station just from the comfort of your own classrooms. Now, Will, before we bring this to an official close, Harmony Hills is just wondering from the ISS, are you able to look at damage done to the ozone layers? We, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, we have an instrument which will be going up on the ISS uh, next year called the SAGE-3 experiment, and that's one of its primary purposes. It's, it's looking at the upper atmosphere and the chemical composition of the atmosphere to get at questions of how ozone formation is occurring or being modified by other elements in the atmosphere. So that is something that we will definitely be looking at. The, the, the CATS, the Cloud Aerosol Transport System uh, that I mentioned earlier, that will also be looking at some of the upper atmosphere dynamics. In particular, they're looking at particulates in the atmosphere, small aerosols, and trying to figure out how those aerosols are affecting whether energy is being reflected back out into space by the, by the atmosphere or whether it's being absorbed and then re-emitted re as heat energy which contributes to the greenhouse gas effect that, that we have measured in the Earth's planet and that's causing, uh, causing warming of the Earth's, uh, Earth's climate in general. So yes, the, the, we will be able to look at that at the ISS very soon. And so that constant uh, sort of thought of other science experiments that can be put on the ISS so that it can be utilized to again help with the understanding of our Earth and its changes uh, that is something the ISS certainly continues to do. Is that correct, Will? Yep. Absolutely. And that's, and that's our plan going forward, is, uh, is to use the ISS as much as we can to collect as much different data as we can while it's up there. Awesome. Well, with that, it is almost 25 minutes past the top of the hour, and Will, we really appreciate you sticking around for these additional questions that have come in from these very bright students, and really throughout the webinar, the responses from all of the students, including those that are still on the line to have a middle school, the Rice School, and Jack Barnes Elementary, uh, your contributions, and Murfreesboro is still out there as well, I believe, uh, and Harmony Hills as well. So all of you groups that are still out there, thank you so much for being such great participants and giving us some great thoughtful answers. And Will, we can't uh, not thank you again for your time, sharing your expertise with all of us, and we really appreciate uh, you joining us today, Will. Uh, once again, it was my pleasure, and I, I enjoyed talking with you all. Excellent. So for, again, uh, this is our last webinar for this, this year, 2014, but hopefully we'll pick up and have some additional webinars starting in 2015. So with that, thank you again for joining us. Have a great holiday season. Hope the weather treats you well out there, and we look forward to connecting with you next year. Bye-bye, everyone.